Hey guys, welcome to our lecture on the cell. So, this is a biology class. You can't have a biology class without talking about the basic unit of life, and that is the cell. Now, we have single celled organisms and we have multi celled organisms. You and I, we're multi celled organisms. In fact, we have about 75 trillion cells making up our body. Think about that for a minute. 75 trillion, that's a whole lot. Well, where are these cells? They are all over the place. They are you. You have skin cells. Your eyes have cells. Your nose has cells. Your feet have cells. Your heart, your liver, you name it, cells are making you up. It's, you're really just a bunch of cells plus some connective tissue and fluids and things like that. But it's all about the cell. And that's what this lecture is about. And in this lecture, you're going to learn about the different kinds of cells and what makes them up. Well, these are very, very busy places. Now, most cells are microscopic. So bacterial cells, where their whole body consists of one cell, those guys are microscopic. You have to have a microscope to see them. Even the cells that make up our body, our skin cells, our heart cells, you really need a microscope to see those guys. But not all cells are microscopic. Take a look at this beauty right here. That is a computer-generated model of a neuron. That's a, a part of your nervous system, right? That's how you make your arm move, right? You have these neurons that look something like this, going from your spinal cord through your, all the way down to your muscles to make them move. So your brain tells this guy what to do. You also have macroscopic cells, with things we can see with our eye, like this, a chicken egg. How many of you knew that a chicken egg is only one cell? Isn't that amazing? And yet it has all the same stuff in it, all the same little compartments that do things that the cells of our body have. So what would be the biggest single cell currently on this earth? Chicken cells are pretty big, but an ostrich egg, right? An ostrich egg, that thing's about that big, and it's one cell. How amazing is that? All right, but we're going to concentrate on in this lecture on what's inside the cell. What makes it tick? What makes it work? And all the things that we're talking about and all this, the reactions that occur, these are going on in your body right now as you watch this. So your body already knows about this stuff. It's just a matter of getting it into the right part of your brain to be able to do it on a test. Well, take a look at this baby right here. This is a diagram of an animal cell. And it's an animal cell that someone's kind of hacked in half so you can see what's inside of it. Now, of course, uh, as you can see with the egg, cells are not, you know, two-dimensional. They are three-dimensional, so an, an egg cell is kind of elliptical. Um, this is little baby toy, kind of is representing what some of the cells in your body might look like. They're 3D and spherical with little proteins sticking out of them that are receptors that will help them to bind to other cells. But you're going to learn all these little things inside the cell and be able to identify them and know their function. Now let's get a little bit of a history about the cell. Um, the, you could say the guy who first discovered cells was this handsome fellow right here. This is Robert Hooke, who lived in the late 1600s, early 1700s. And he took some cork from a cork tree. And he looked at it, and he noticed um, that under a lens, it kind of looked like it had little rectangular compartments. And he called those cellulae to mean rooms. And that's kind of where we get the term cell from. Uh, the Latin for cell is cyto. So you'll notice some words in this class that say cyto something. That means it's referring to the cell. Uh, this guy right here, his name was Lewenhook, and he's really the first guy to invent the microscope. And this is in the late 1600s. I mean, this is long before Facebook, right? This is back when there really was no technology. Well, he was able to just get a couple lenses together and see microscopic things. So... He took a scraping from his teeth and saw a little squiggly thing, and he called these animacules. They were from his teeth. Hmm, lovely. And you can see that he's also made diagrams of sperm. Now, where he got those specimens from, I can't say. Uh, this guy, Matthias uh, Schleiden, in the sort of early-ish 1800s, was the one who kind of put together this idea that plants are also made of cells, not just animals. And this guy down here, Theodore Schwann, in 1839, realized that cells have lives of their own, that that's what animal tissue is made of, including humans. We're made of cells. And so he kind of put this together, that the cell was the basic unit of life. 
So this is kind of how it all got started. And ultimately, scientists were able to come up with a theory. And you guys remember what a theory is in science, some, something with lots of experimental evidence to back it up. Well, scientists have come up with what's known as the cell theory. And that is that all organisms, whether you're a bacterial cell, a plant, or a human, are made up of at least one cell. So we're made up of one or more cells, and it's within these cells that all the life's processes occur. All the metabolic reactions, everything that makes us alive, happens inside these little cells, most of which are microscopic. Pretty amazing, isn't it? So the amount of reactions going on inside a little microscopic cell, whether it's your skin cell or your liver cell or whatever kind of cell, is absolutely amazing. I mean, these reactions are going on in fractions of a second, millions of them a day. It's just amazing how busy your body is. So when they say you're a busy body, you say, why, well, yes, I am. I, all 75 trillion of my cells are very busy right now. So cells are the smallest living thing, according to many scientists. Now, that actually is debatable. Uh, many biologists, including myself, believe that viruses are alive. And viruses are not composed of cells. They're basically a protein coat with some genetic material, things like that. Um, so it really depends on how you define life. And how do we define life? We'll get into that discussion a little bit later. But cells are the uh, smallest living thing, according to most scientists, according to cell theory. And the theory also states that life's evolved only one time about three and a half billion years ago. So in other words, the theory says that all life, whether you're a plant, bacterial cell, human, whatever, all of us originated with a common ancestor, a single cell that evolved about three and a half billion years ago. We'll get into that a little more later on in the term when we get into discussions of evolutionary biology. So one thing we do know is certainly the cells of today can only come from other cells. So all cells originate from previous cells. You can't just spontaneously do I dream of genie and have a cell appear. It comes from other cells. And you're going to learn in a couple weeks exactly how that process happens. Um, by the way, I don't know if you can, because the way this recording goes, I know that they stick my face right in the corner here, so it might be covering it up. I can't see that while I'm recording. But um, uh, you'll see here, these cells right here are human red blood cells. These little pink things, those are red blood cells that are making up a good portion of your blood. And the little purplish ones, these are all white blood cells that are part of your immune system. Um, this down here, I think this is an electron micrograph of some fungi. And down here, these are actually onion cells. So you'll be looking at those under a microscope um, in, if you're taking the lab course. And notice how these onion cells are kind of boxy. They're like rectangular because plant cells have rigid cell walls, whereas animal cells, like our blood cells, don't have a rigid cell wall. They just have a nice supple cell membrane. So we'll get into that in a little bit. So how big are cells? Well, other than the eggs, not very big. Most of them are microscopic. And why is that? Why can't this egg be as large as a room? Why haven't, haven't they evolved to be that way? Well, it has to do with what's called a surface to volume ratio. And I have that right here, surface to volume ratio. And that is that if you get into the math of this, and I will skip over the math of this because I know some of you out there might not be math fans, but if you were into the math, you could do some examples here to explain that volume increases faster than surface area. So if I were to start expanding this egg, the volume inside would grow a lot faster than the surface area surrounding it. Well, if you've ever played with a balloon and blown it up, you know that if you blow it up too much, that volume has increased faster than the surface area, the rubber, and it will go kaplooey, right? So same thing with our cells. We can get a lot more bang for our buck by having little compartmentalized structures inside called organelles. That way we can increase the surface area to get work done that's a lot more efficient than just trying to make the cell big where the volume's increasing so fast that it might explode before you get done everything that you need to get done. Okay, so surface area, which I've abbreviated SA here, increases by the square of the diameter, whereas volume increases by the cube of the diameter. So again, bottom line, volume increases faster than surface area, and that's why we don't have cells that are 300 pounds walking along the sidewalk. 
Okay, two main types of cells that we know of in life and that we discuss in biology. We have prokaryotes and we have eukaryotes. A prokaryote is just a single-celled bacterial cell, um, so, but prokaryote means in Latin before the nut, and it's considered to be more primitive than, than eukaryotic cells, although I really don't like that word. But the key to prokaryotes versus eukaryotes like us is that prokaryotic cells have no organelles, not like eukaryotic cells do. They have no nucleus, and you can see this little bacterial cell diagram here. They kind of just very simple. Their DNA, their genetic material, is just a circular piece of genetic material thrown in there into the middle. There's no nucleus, no little envelope to contain that genetic material. It's kind of vulnerable, right? But it's just kind of thrown there. Um, they have cell walls in addition to cell membranes, but their cell walls are different from plants. We'll get into that in a little bit. They're really small. This is 1 to 10 micrometers. This little Greek symbol here is called mu. It means 1 1 millionth. In this case, 1 1 millionth of a meter is a micrometer. Sometimes you'll hear them called microns as well. Um, and some bacteria, like for example, the bacteria that causes tuberculosis or the bacteria that causes botulism, those guys actually have, in addition to a cell membrane and a cell wall, they have a capsule, which is gives them protection against the immune systems of animals like us. So there's kind of been this what we call a co-evolutionary arms race between the pathogens, like the bacteria, and the hosts, like the humans. So our immune system is kind of evolving to evade the bacterial cell, and the bacterial cells evolving to evade our immune system, and it goes on forever like that. Here's some pictures of some typical prokaryotic bacterial cells. These are, they come in different shapes and sizes. These are rod shaped. We got some spiral shaped here. These little ones have little tails on them that help them move. Those are called flagella. We'll get into that a little bit later. So some are round and occur in chains. So anyway, but the main idea I want you to know for this lecture is that prokaryotes have no organelles, no nucleus. They're considered kind of primitive and they tend to be smaller than all the rest of the cells of the world, the eukaryotic cells. Okay, so those are prokaryotic cells. Eukaryotic cells are all the kinds of cells that make up animals, plants, fungi, um, protists. Pretty much any kind of thing that's not a bacterial cell is a eukaryotic cell. In Latin, this means true nut, and the key to our cells is that our eukaryotic cells have organelles. We have all the stuff inside, and each of these things do different things. So they each have their own function that helps these cells to survive, and in the case of multi-celled creatures like us, helps the whole organism to function. So we have a nucleus, so all of our genetic materials housed there, and we'll go over that in a sec. Size-wise, eukaryotic cells tend to be bigger than prokaryotes, so compare the size difference here. Uh, here's just a nice picture of some beautiful eukaryotic cells. These are red blood cells, and this is a white blood cell using an electron microscope, which is, those babies are really expensive. Okay, so now we're going to go over the cellular organelles. Okay, so let's get into the nitty-gritty of these cellular organelles. And in the background on the slide here, you can see a beautiful Golgi apparatus, computer generated, of course. But anyway, we're going to get into what the Golgi apparatus and the rest of these organelles are all about. So one way you can think of a cell, because as I mentioned, it's a busy, busy place, you can kind of think of it as a factory. So if you had to design a factory, what would you put in it? How would you get products produced and taken to where they need to go? Well, you're going to need someone to head the whole operation, and that someone's going to want a nice little office. And so you can kind of think of that as the nucleus of the cell, where the genetic material is housed, because that's the brain of the cell. Um, and then you're going to need, you know, an energy source. You're going to need an assembly line that's going to actually produce the products and it'll use the energy from that energy source to, to run that assembly line. And then the things that get produced on that assembly line are going to have to be taken around to other parts of the factory or shipped outside of the factory. Um, you're going to have to have uh, areas to break down the waste that you're producing in the process, you know, kind of like the recycling bins. you got to get rid of any poisons that are produced in the process of making all those things. So 
Anyway, your cell does all this stuff. Your cell is a little factory. It's out there to produce things, make things run. It's got to have energy to do all these things. So we're going to we're going to go over each of these organelles, but keep thinking back to this factory example as you're going through, and that'll help you to kind of learn these organelles if you can kind of relate them to a factory. So let's get started. Here is another diagram of an animal cell, and this has a lot of these um, organelles labeled. So each of these little things is called an organelle, and each organelle has its own function. So by the end of this lecture, you should be able to go back to this diagram, identify these organelles, and tell me what do they do? What do they do for the cell? Why do cells have to have these things? If we go back to this baby toy here, and imagine this is a cell. All those little organelles are inside the cell, but on the outside of the cell is kind of the gate that's going to let stuff go in or out of the cells or keep, it, keep stuff out of the cell altogether. So we're going to go over first the external cell morphology. Morphology just means structure, right? So the external cell structure. So for animal cells, and all cells actually, they're surrounded by what's called a plasma membrane. Plasma membrane. So it's surrounding the cells, and the diagram you see here is a diagram of what's called the fluid mosaic model. That means it's a theory, right? It's how we think this me cell membrane is structured. But it's not a guess, it's based on evidence. So notice that the cell membrane is actually a busy place as well. And if you've ever been to like, this is, might be a mainland thing, but if you've ever been to Chuck E. Cheese, and you might remember that Chuck E. Cheese has this ball thing where you can jump into the balls and there's all these little balls and the balls kind of move around when you jump in. That's kind of what this cell membrane is like. Because the cell membrane is composed of phospholipids. Remember those guys? Phospholipids, they're kind of lipid. And here's an example of a diagram of one phospholipid. And you might recall phospholipids have fatty acid chains. These fatty acids are composed of carbons and hydrogens. And they have two fatty acid chains. One of these fatty acid chains has all single bonds between the carbons, so it's straight. It's saturated, right, with hydrogens, whereas the other one has a kink to it. And you can see these people here representing straight fatty acid chains and a kinked fatty acid chain. So there's a double bond between two of those carbons there. So the fatty acid chains are nonpolar, and the head of the phospholipid is polar. That's a glycerol molecule. It's polar. Now, why am I telling you this? Because it's very important to the structure of cells. The cell membrane of a cell is a phospholipid bilayer. That means it has two layers of these phospholipids. And if you imagine that these two fingers are the fatty acids and my palm is the glycerol head, then the bilayer is like this. So you have a polar glycerol head facing outside of the cell and a polar glycerol head facing inside the cell. And the two sets of fatty acid chains, the nonpolar fatty acid chains, are facing each other. And so that's kind of what these kids here are doing. Um, so their, their legs are kind of, these represent the fatty acid chains, and then their heads facing outside the cell and inside the cell. Um, and so here with this diagram, you can see these two sets of phospholipids. Here are the glycerol heads facing outside the cell. We call that the extracellular fluid or extracellular matrix. And here would be inside the cell. And so you can see there's a set of glycerol molecules facing inside the cell. And then these fatty acid chains are facing each other. Why? Why does it, is it like that? Why couldn't it be the other way? Well, if you remember back to chemistry, it's all about charges, right? If you don't have the polarity on the glycerol heads, then molecules that need to come in and get inside that cell or molecules that need to go outside that cell won't be attracted to that cell membrane. They need those charges on those phospholipid heads so that you know, positive and negative attract, and something like maybe, maybe it's another protein, maybe it's a glucose molecule, maybe it's water, whatever it is, those partial charges on those molecules will be attracted to the partial charges on the cell membrane and will be able to go inside the cell, or things we need to get outside the cell will be attracted to the glycerol heads inside the cell and be able to get outside. So all of that is really important, right? You have to have those charges. If those phospholipids had been turned the other way and the tails were facing, outside the cell and inside instead of the other way around, 
life on Earth would have never gotten started, you wouldn't be sitting here watching this lecture. So really important. Now, the other thing about um, the cell membrane is it's, it's not just phospholipids. There's all sorts of stuff stuck in there. So if you look at this diagram, you'll see stuff. And these stuff are proteins. So this is an example of a peripheral protein. We have what are called integral proteins. So the idea is they're just proteins sitting stuck in these phospholipids. And uh, these are important because a lot of molecules, as you'll soon learn, can't cross that plasma membrane without the help of these proteins and that's because they're too big or they don't have the right charge or whatever usually they're just too big so we have to have little proteins stuck in the cell membrane to help things across now sometimes these proteins might have other things stuck to them like this is a glycolipid or a glycoprotein or whatever carbohydrates stuck to there and that those are kind of like flags to tell the molecules that need to cross that membrane. Hello, here I am, come get me. So lots of stuff sticking in and out of that cell membrane. And that's why I like this baby toy because it kind of shows that a cell has lots of stuff sticking out of it. Okay, so lots of things going on on that cell membrane. So for example, our immune cells. How does a white blood cell know to attack a pathogen, a bacterium or something that gets into your body? Well, many times it is because of these little cell protein receptors that stick out of the cell. These will be able to kind of attach to proteins stuck on, for example, a bacterial cell and allow him to attack it and kill it. So you need lots of things stuck on that cell membrane for lots of different reasons. So here is another picture. This is computer generated of a plasma membrane, just a little chunk of it, but remember, Plasma membrane is 3D, right? It's covering this whole spherical cell. Um, but just to give you again this idea of the you know, phospholipid bilayer, so your nonpolar fatty acid tails in the middle, glycerol molecules facing the outside and the inside of the cell, and these little proteins stuck in there with, you know, all sorts of flags, carbs, lipids, proteins, whatever stuck on there. There's also some cholesterols stuck in the middle. And these guys are not just static like this baby toy looks like it's static but it's actually these things are moving around think back to our Chuck E. Cheese example right if you jump into the those balls they move around they're not just stuck so the plasma membrane of a cell is kind of like a bunch of jelly it's just kind of moving along and stuff moves through there so it's a very fluid um, place that's why it's called the fluid mosaic model it's not static but all sorts of things are going to bind to all these things that are stuck out here. And uh, just as an example, HIV is a very clever virus. This virus actually takes advantage of things on our own immune cells. It likes to attack T cells, which are immune cells that have certain kinds of proteins stuck in their cell membrane. So they have re protein receptors in the cell membrane called CD4 protein. And that HIV is able to actually trick our cell into thinking it's one of our own. And that virus has the ability to actually attach to that CD4 protein and therefore get incorporated into our immune cell and kill our T cells, our immune cells. So it actually kills the very cells that are supposed to kill it. Pretty smart evolutionary genius. Um, so again, just a quick review. Uh, we have... Um, these proteins called integral and peripheral proteins you know this diagram makes it look even busier because you have it's just illustrating you have different shapes of proteins some look more like that some look more like that whatever but lots of stuff um, sticking out of there and lots of cholesterol in here and that's going to help to strengthen that membrane help it buffer against extremes like extreme temperatures things like that um, you have some of these things sticking out here called glycolipids. So anyway, bottom line is cell membrane, busy place. Okay, so if I were to take that baby toy and cut it in half, and I'm not going to do that because I'm not going to destroy the toy, but inside you're going to find this kind of jelly-like stuff that all these organelles are in. And that is called the cytoplasm. Cyto means cell. And this is going to contain all the organelles plus this watery jelly-like substance called cytosol. So cytosol is kind of syrupy, it's kind of viscous, 
but it contains mostly water, because obviously we are mostly water, but it also contains a lot of ions and nutrients, proteins, amino acids, carbs, all that kind of stuff. Um, and it also stores things that we need, like glycogen, depending on the cell that you're talking about. But anyway, all that stuff surrounding these organelles is a cytoplasm consisting of cytosol. And also going through that cytoplasm are lots of what I call railroad tracks. They're protein skeletal fibers in a sense. They're made up of different kinds of proteins. And if you take a diagram of it, it kind of looks like this. All these little network of fibers is part of the cytoskeleton, the cell's skeleton. Um, here's an actual microscopic photograph um, that is showing this cell stained with green fluorescent protein, GFP, which is created actually by glow-in-the-dark jellyfish. And we've taken the gene for making the jellyfish glow and put it into whatever cell this happens to be, and ta-da, you get glowing cells. So cool. We'll get into all that cool stuff in a little bit. But anyway, these um, the cytoskeleton, these fibers, are actually just like railroad tracks because it hasn't been that long since scientists discovered this. But it turns out all the organelles that we're going to talk about are anchored in by these fibers of the cytoskeleton, and they actually move along the fibers just like they were trains on a railroad track. It's so cool. When I was in school, they didn't know this. So this is stuff that's just been discovered in the last couple decades, and you get to learn it because you're taking this class at exactly the right time. So anyway, these things are made out of proteins. Proteins are made out of amino acids. We'll get into all the details of how they're formed later on in a different lecture, but just know that protein fibers are making up a skeleton that kind of runs through this whole cell and anchors all these organelles and allows them to kind of travel along um, from place to place in the cell. Okay, getting into the core of the cell, we have the nucleus. And obviously the nucleus is considered the brain of the cell because it houses our genetic material, DNA. DNA is housed inside the nucleus. It's produced in the nucleus, and so are some other nucleic acids like RNA. And we'll get into those guys a little bit later as well. But the nice thing is that our genetic material is protected. All eukaryotic cells have nuclei, and that protects our genetic material because it's they're enveloped in this nice little nuclear envelope that has little holes called nuclear pores, and that allows actually some things to go inside and outside of that nucleus. And right smack in the middle of that nucleus is another organelle called a nucleolus, and the nucleolus is where a nucleic acid called rRNA is produced, and it also is a place where another kind of organelle called ribosomes are created. But Anyway, this is the nucleus, home of the nucleic acids. Now, once you get outside of that nucleus, you'll see these little stacks of things. So if you take this little picture of the cell, here was our nucleus, there's your nucleolus, and right outside you have these stacks of membranes, and they're actually continuous with that nuclear envelope, with the nuclear membrane. They kind of just, that membrane starts folding out, and you get these stacks of folds of an organelle called the endoplasmic reticulum. See if you can say that, endoplasmic reticulum, commonly called the ER, but I do want you to learn endoplasmic reticulum. Here's a photograph of an endoplasmic reticulum. And really what it is is just, it's a plasma membrane, phospholipid bilayer, folded into all sorts of stacks. And it's very important, this is your assembly line of your cell. So just like in a factory, products get produced on an assembly line, the ER inside of your cell is where the products that your cell needs to produce are going to be created. And there's two types. So we have a type like this called the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And then you have one like this that has little things that look like poppy seeds on them. And that's called the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So we have rough ER and smooth ER. Now, the smooth ER is primarily responsible for producing our lipids and our carbohydrates. So remember the four molecules of life, nucleic acids, carbs, lipids, proteins. Well, the nucleic acids are produced in the nucleus. That was uh, the CEO's office in there, right? But the carbs and lipids are produced in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, and the proteins are produced on the rough endoplasmic reticulum because these little poppy seeds are organelles called ribosomes, 
Ribosomes are produced in the nucleolus, but they settle in the cytoplasm and on top of this endoplasmic reticulum here because those guys are where proteins are actually produced. Okay, so here's another little picture of a ribosome, kind of looks like a little mushroom, but these are the little poppy seeds that are on the rough ER. Okay, so surface of the ER is used for carb and lipid synthesis, and when there's ribosomes involved, protein synthesis, the creation of proteins. Okay, so keep that in mind. Ribosomes are where proteins are made, and they like to settle on that endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, so let's go back here and think of our factory. So the brain of the factory, the CEO, the one sending out the directions, the instructions for doing everything, that's in the nucleus, right? That's the CEO's office is the nucleus of the um, cell. Now, he's going to take those blueprints, those instructions for what to produce on the assembly line, those get shipped out to the endoplasmic reticulum, where, which is the assembly line. That's where your carbs, lipids, and proteins are going to be produced. But then once you've got it produced, you've got to ship them somewhere. And that is the job of this guy, the Golgi apparatus, sometimes called the Golgi complex or the Golgi body, just synonyms for the same thing. And these guys are also stacks of plasma membrane. And they're just, they're just stacked on top of each other, little folds. But these guys, I like to think of this guy as the UPS station. So you took the stuff off the assembly line, now you take it to the UPS station to get packaged and shipped. And that's what happens here. So all those carbs, lipids, and proteins that were produced on the, in the endoplasmic reticulum now get shipped along that cytoskeleton to, in, in little things called vesicles, little bubbles, um, to the Golgi apparatus where they are going to get packaged so they get put into little, other little vesicles that are just, these little bubbles are called vesicles, and they're just pinching off that Golgi apparatus. They're going to gonna get packaged in vesicles, and they're also going to get stamped. Just like if you take your package to the UPS store, they have to put an address label on it. Well, same thing. These little products from the ER need address labels. So it's going to stamp some other carbs onto your carbs, lipids, and proteins that you produced in the ER, and that way it knows where to go. And it's going to ship these guys either to places inside the cell where they're needed or actually outside of the cell through the plasma membrane to wherever these guys are need to be taken to, other cells or wherever. So here's a picture of a stained Golgi apparatus. These are little vesicles around there carrying stuff. So that's your UPS guy. And so I have actually on this slide, uh, well, here's a, a micrograph showing a Golgi apparatus. Here's another picture of it. And this is to remind you that the Golgi apparatus is kind of like the, gold, the UPS station and the vesicles are like the UPS truck, right? And don't forget, it gets little address labels in the form of carbohydrates. Okay, so these are flattened stacked stacks. The stacks are called cisternae. A cistern, you might know what a cistern is just from everyday life. It's something that holds stuff, right? Like, like a water cistern would hold rainwater. And these guys are going to take those newly formed carbs, lipids, and proteins that were created in the ER and put them in vesicles and ship them. So these are going to package molecules that were made in the ER, tag them with carbohydrates, pinch off little Golgi body vesicles and ship these guys, just like this UPS guy, to wherever they need to go. Okay, so what have we done in our factory? We said, okay, we know who our CEO is. That's the nucleus and the, the blueprints that the, that the CEO are sending out are the genetic material and the DNA. That's getting shipped out to the assembly line, the, which is the endoplasmic reticulum where the smooth ER is going to produce the carbs and the lipids, and the rough ER containing the ribosomes are going to produce the proteins. And then what all the products that get produced on the ER get shipped to the Golgi apparatus. That's the UPS station. It's going to get stamped with some carbs, shipped in vesicles to wherever it needs to go. Now, along the way, as stuff is being produced, there's waste products being produced. And we got to get rid of those waste products. Some of these waste products are... Um, hydrogen peroxide, which is highly toxic to cells. Sometimes if it's a cell that's engulfed like a bacterium or other some other bad critter, those bacterium might get broken down and those broken down products are waste. We got to recycle those guys. Now the cool thing about our bodies is that we don't like to waste waste. 
we like to recycle. We have very green cells, very environmentally conscious cells, because we don't waste anything. We repackage it and use it for something else. So if we take a bacterial cell, break it down, we're going to take the elements that are making up that bacterial cell and use them to make other things we need, proteins, DNA, whatever, right? So we like to recycle things. Well, in your cells, you have organelles called lysosomes, and here they are. And these lysosomes contain an enzymes that will digest things. So they're going to help to break down these waste products and recycle them. So here's a diagram showing some lysozymes here. So going back, here is your nucleus. Here is the endoplasmic reticulum. Here are the products inside transport vesicles from the endoplasmic reticulum taken to the Golgi apparatus, pinched off into Golgi vesicles. And, and some of these will attach to lysozymes where they can break stuff down. And then some of these products are taken outside the cell membrane or inside. But this is to remind you that these lysozymes are your recycling center. So inside your factory, there's a recycling center. These guys are your recycling centers. They digest worn out cells um, or cell components. They recycle proteins and they break down eaten cells. So we've gone over a nucleus. We've gone over an endoplasmic reticulum, rough and smooth. You talked about the nucleolus inside of the nucleus. We've talked about the Golgi apparatus and lysozymes. And now we're going to talk about another little vesicle of things floating around inside that cytoplasm. And that are those are the peroxisomes. The peroxisomes are also vesicles. These ones have been stained with green fluorescent protein. Again, from a jellyfish. How cool is that? And these guys contain some enzymes that will help break stuff down, um, especially hydrogen peroxide. Um, and in plants, the peroxisomes are going to help convert plant fats to carbohydrates. In animal cells, these guys are detoxifying things. So these are our detoxifying organelles. Um, they're going to help break hydrogen peroxide as one toxin down into water and oxygen gas. So we got peroxisomes, we got lysosomes, Golgi apparatus, smooth and rough ER, nucleus with a nucleolus. We got a busy place going on inside our cells. But all the things we do in our cells could not happen unless we had energy. So remember the energy, like kind of the furnace inside your factory? Well, that comes from the mitochondria that are inside our cells. Mitochondrium, singular. Mitochondria is plural. And these guys kind of look like little pills inside of, the, inside of the cytoplasm. So let me see if I can get my cursor here to show you what one of these guys looks like. Or if you cut it in half, it would look like this. This is actual photograph of these guys. And you'll see these little, looks like ridges going through. Those were actually stacks of membrane. Um, and those are where our cellular respiration is going to go, aerobic cellular respiration. We'll have a whole lecture on cellular respiration, but this guy is where it happens. And the main purpose of the mitochondria is it is our powerhouse of the cell. It's what produces our energy. And that energy is in the form of a molecule called ATP. And when we break the bonds of ATP, we release energy. Well, to fuel this furnace, you got to put in the food. And that food is in the form of glucose that we get from our food, as we discussed before, C6H12O6. That mitochondria is going to take that glucose, rearrange it, and spit out some ATP, spit out some carbon dioxide, etc. We'll get into that a little bit later. But again, it has these little membranes inside. So there's an inner membrane, and those are called the cristae. And uh, stuff happens inside those membranes. But anyway, we'll get into respiration a little bit later. But for now, I want you to just realize that, you know, we have a lot of stuff going on in these mitochondria. And so the more, um, the more stuff your cell needs to do, the more of these mitochondria you'll have. So, for example, muscle cells um, have a lot of mitochondria in them because they need a lot of ATP. They need lots of energy to do what they do. Um, sperm cells, there's a lot of mitochondria packed into uh, part of that sperm cell because these guys need lots of energy to get to where they're going, right? And again, just look at this beautiful picture of these guys. Here's a diagram, et cetera. Okay, now, if you are a plant, you're actually more complicated than an animal cell like we are made of. Chloroplasts are only in plant cells. They're not in animal cells. And they're green. This is what makes plants green. 
Chloroplasts are the site of photosynthesis. This is where the plant is harnessing the energy of the sun and converting it into food. And that food is not only food for the plant, but food for animals that eat the plant and animals that eat the animals that eat the plant, etc. So these are some chloroplasts, and here's a diagram of them. Simple little things. They just look like also kind of pill-shaped little things inside a plant cell. But these guys are so complicated. There is so much stuff happening in these little itty-bitty spaces here. So I always like to say cells, phenomenal cosmic power, itty-bitty living space. But anyway, again, chloroplasts are in plants. They're not in animals. Anyway, and then inside there, there's like the semi-liquid jelly-like substance called stroma. Don't worry about the details of this. When we talk about plants later on, we'll get into more detail of the chloroplasts and how photosynthesis works. But for now, just know plants have chloroplasts and mitochondria. Animal cells only have mitochondria. Now, let's stop for a second, talk about mitochondria and chloroplasts in a little more detail and the nucleus, etc. Where did all these organelles come from? How do you go from a prokaryotic bacterial cell that has no organelles to this complex eukaryotic cell that has all these things that each have their own functions? Well, we don't really know for sure. But um, there's a, a theory, it's almost more of a hypothesis, um, as to the origin of the nucleus and the origin of chloroplasts and mitochondria. So in terms of how did a nucleus come about, here's kind of what we think, and also the ER. Um, imagine a prokaryotic cell. It has a cell membrane under its cell wall, and that membrane is a phospholipid bilayer. Imagine over evolutionary time, that membrane kind of, uh, invaginated, right? It kind of dipped in, and over time, if that invagination started expanding and started kind of encompassing that genetic material, the DNA that was basically naked, it had no protection, so you eventually you go from something that looks like this to something that looks like that, where now you have a membrane, an envelope around that genetic material, well, that guy would have an advantage over a cell whose genetic material is naked. He's less prone to other cells coming in and grabbing his DNA and mixing with it or inserting genes that, that aren't desirable. And there's some evidence nowadays. Here's a uh, bacterium called nitrobacter that you can kind of see how these membranes have sort of formed inside the cell from the outer membrane. And uh, so you can kind of see how something like this could have happened. But it would definitely be better to have packaged genetic material than unpackaged ma genetic material. So any that had mutations that allowed that membrane to kind of surround the nucleus would probably survive better and live longer to reproduce and pass the mutation for doing that onto the offspring. Now, as far as mitochondria and chloroplasts go, we have what's called the theory of endosymbiosis. And this is the idea that early on there were larger prokaryotic cells and there were smaller prokaryotic cells. And the larger ones like to eat the smaller ones, right, and engulf them. But, and we have bacterial cells that kind of do that nowadays. But imagine that instead of eating and digesting the cells that they ate, they actually were able to, the, the cells that got eaten were able to escape digestion and kind of took up residency inside the host cell. Well, that host cell, so kind of like this, right? That host cell would actually start to gain advantages by having that little escapee live inside of its cytoplasm because that escapee is able to produce lots of ATP, lots of energy. Well, if the host cell can harness some of that energy, it'll be more successful, be able to do more things and probably live longer and pass its genes on to the next generation. Meanwhile, the happy camper there, the, the escapee, is now getting a place to live and extra nutrients from the host. So they've developed kind of this mutualistic symbiosis. Um, and they think that what was originally just little bacterial cells um, over time became the mitochondria and the chloroplasts inside of eukaryotic cells. So lots of evidence for this. Um, the mitochondria and chloroplasts are able to reproduce on their own, independent of the nucleus of the, of the cell. Not only are they able to reproduce on their own, um, you know, they can respirate on their own. They, you know, they're a lot of evidence. They're the same size as some of these other bacterial cells, so um, they have their own DNA. So there's a lot of evidence that this might be how 
uh, mitochondria and chloroplasts came to be. Theory of endosymbiosis, that mitochondria and chloroplasts used to be bacteria, took up residency inside their host cells, and were able to set up a mutualistic symbiosis. So um, chloroplasts, by undergoing photosynthesis inside the host cell, were able to provide oxygen to the host, whereas mitochondria, by taking up residency, were able to provide a lot more energy for the host and therefore make that host cell a lot more efficient so it could do more metabolic activities. Um, there's some evidence for this, like, for example, um, there are certain kinds of sea slugs and other um, organisms called protists that are photosynthetic. And the reason they're photosynthetic is they go along and enslave chloroplasts from algae that they eat. So they eat the algae, they take the chloroplasts out of the al algae and actually incorporate them into their own cells. And then for about six weeks, they're able to actually photosynthesize. So, um, so there is evidence in the real world that cells are capable of doing these kinds of things. Okay, so next organelle, we got centrioles, and centrioles are these guys. They're also made of protein, and centrioles we'll be talking a lot more about when we talk about how cells actually divide and reproduce. Um, so they're involved with, um, with the reproduction of cells. Uh, so they're assembled from my, uh, proteins called microtubules, and these are them, and here's a, some pictures of centrioles. But um, in a nutshell, don't worry too much about them right now, but they help to anchor and move what are called chromosomes, which is just DNA packed into little structures, and those are called chromosomes. Again, most important right now is just know that they're involved with cellular reproduction. We'll talk a lot more about them later on. Now, cells can also move around. Some of them can anyway. So, for example, this sperm cell here has a little tail on there, and that tail is called a flagellum, or plural is flagella and flagella are kind of like whips they're going to go choo, 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 to propel the cell along so in humans the only cells that have flagella are sperm cells so females we don't have any flagella in our body at all males will have um have flagella on their sperm um so not only do cells like sperm have flagella but um, a lot of bacterial species have a flagellum, and that helps them to kind of move through the host or find um, resources that they need to survive. So flagellum, method of movement. But that's not the only hairy thing that some cells have. Some cells have cilia, and these are electron micrograph of cilia. And these guys are, I think of them as windshield wipers. They beat back and forth like this. Uh, the cells of our trachea, our windpipe, have these guys to help beat out the bad stuff. Um, in fact, if you're a smoker, very likely that some of these cilia have been burned off of your cells, um, which makes you more vulnerable to pathogens. But the good thing is if you quit smoking, within five years, these cilia can grow back. So it's always a good idea to quit if you, if you do smoke. But anyway, cilia often expel junk out of an area. They're also found, for example, in the fallopian tubes of women because they'll beat back and forth to help the egg move along the fallopian tube. Um, but there's tons of them, all kind of in these little hair-like structures. So they're little short structures. Um, and then another little cellular plasma membrane projection um, that some cells have, uh, these are called microvilli. And for example, these are on one side of the cells of our small intestine. And this will help to kind of um, not just help stuff move along, but more of a function of absorption. So think of a, a towel, like a beach towel or a bath towel. You know those little loops there, those the terry cloth? Why do towels have the little loops? Well, because you're increasing surface area to allow for more absorption of water. And the same thing happens with the microvilli on the cells of things like our intestines. They're also found in the kidneys where, where stuff needs to get absorbed. So having these little microvilli makes more surface area absorb more stuff. Um, and so in the in the... In the intestines, these guys under a microscope kind of look like a little fuzzy line, and thus we call it a brush border. So this is a brush border on this picture right here. Where did my cursor go? Cursor, come back. There it is. Okay, so this is the brush border of microvilli. Here they are under a, an electron microscope. But um, this will, again, just increase surface area to absorb more nutrients, which is what our intestines need to do. And the picture down here at the bottom is just a sperm cell showing a flagellum, not cilia or microvilli, 
and up here our cilia that would be lining, for example, our trachea. Okay, that's it for the parts of the cell. So let's just real quick recap. I'm as our CEO. It's the nucleus, contains the genetic material. And that's where our DNA is produced. That's where RNA is produced, especially the nucleolus inside of the nucleus. Um, our production line, our assembly line, is the endoplasmic reticulum. The smooth kind produces carbs and lipids. The rough kind has ribosomes and produces the proteins. Those products get shipped out in transport vesicles to the Golgi apparatus. This is our UPS station where those products are going to get packaged up, shipped out in Golgi apparatus uh, vesicles to wherever they need to go inside or outside the cell. If they go outside the cell, they have to get through the plasma membrane, which is a bilayer of phospholipids, polar heads to the inside and outside of the cell, nonpolar tails in the middle. Lots of proteins stuck in there with flags of carbs and glycoproteins and glycolipids on there to flag stuff, whether it can come in or out, and help it across the plasma membrane. And to fuel all this, we have energy in the form of ATP produced by our furnace called the mitochondria. And the mitochondria undergo aerobic respiration to break food down and convert it into energy. All right. Um, and then a few other things in there, like some uh, vesicles called lysosomes, which secrete... Uh, recycling enzymes that break stuff down and recycle it, or peroxisomes that break down the toxins like hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen gas. All that stuff is in there. And it's all very cool, happening in 75 trillion cells, making up your body right this instant. All right. See you online. Bye-bye.